All right, class. So here we go. We're about to get right back into our uh, discussion on logical fallacies. Whoa, that was scary. We're about to get back into our discussion on logical fallacies, um, and we're going to devote all of our time to that here. Um, don't know why this is going on. Let's see if I can get rid of that. Anyway, I guess we can't, but that's no big deal. So we're going to get back into our logical fallacies. We're going to jump back into it again, devote all of our time here for this particular lecture. You're going to get a lot out of this uh a lot out of this lecture. This is what I think is going to be very pertinent to um, your life, right? What's going to be uh, applicable, even if you don't decide to major in philosophy in some way, right? This is going to help you think so much more clearly when you get into argument, when you're listening to argument, when you get into a debate, when you're listening to debate. These are going to help you tremendously uh, as you pursue uh, this lecture or as we go into this lecture here. Here we go. All right, so we got through all this. Let's get back to our informal fallacies. Now, why are we kind of concentrating on informal fallacies in our introduction to logic and not necessarily all the, the, the rule type stuff? Does anybody remember why? Does anybody remember? Does anybody remember? So we got through this. All right, so. All right, where were we? Did we do this? Argument of ad baculum? Yeah. All right. Argument of ad hominem? Yeah, yeah we did this because remember we talked about like... Okay. All right, so we did argument of ad hominem, which is similar to genetic fallacy, right? Now, did we get to genetic fallacy or did we just... Or did we end right before we talked about it? Okay, so we didn't talk about genetic fallacy <clears throat> much. Now, yeah, I think we, I think, I remember we mentioned it because remember when we were going through our stuff that we had written on the board about, you know, do you believe this for whatever reason? And is that, does that mean it's false because you believe it for whatever reason? Does that mean the conclusion is false? So again, let's say that, uh, or you guys tell me what would, what would be an example of the genetic fallacy? All right, so you're on the right track. So, but now if someone were to turn and say what, that would be an example of the genetic fallacy. Yeah. If they were to turn and say what? If someone were to say to that person, that they're, they're, that they're, the implication being that their belief is wrong, right? That would be an example of the genetic fallacy. So, again, like when we were going through the board, is that a strong reason in and of itself to hold to some particular belief because your mama said so? No. no. Mama right. But if someone were to try to say, so therefore your belief is wrong, because, well, the only reason you believe that is because your mama said so. Well, if, the implicate, if they're trying to say that the belief is wrong, well, that's a, an example of the genetic fallacy. No. Why? Why you believe something what has nothing to do with the ontological status of the belief itself, right? The status can be true or false. Why you believe it, you could have the worst possible reason on the planet to believe whatever you believe, whatever the belief is. But it still doesn't mean the belief itself is false, right? And we can see that because that's a double-edged sword, right? So if someone were to say, oh, the only reason you're you know, a Baptist or whatever is because your parents were Baptists and you were raised Baptist and all that, and you therefore imply that, you know, that denomination or whatever is wrong, well, that's the genetic fallacy because it could be right. They may have no good reason as to why they should believe it, but it still could be right. Now, the flip side of that, the way we can see that that's how that could how that's not a good way to, how, or why that's fallacious, why the genetic fallacy is, is, is a misstep in reasoning, because you could turn that around and say, why? You could say the exact opposite. What could you say? Say the, the Baptist guy could say what? To the person saying that to him. Right, right. You're right. Right. You're just an atheist because you're brainwashed your whole life to that certain worldview, right? And then 
but that doesn't mean what? That is true or false either, right? Because remember, what's the point of all these fallacies? They always divert you away from what? Right, the issue at hand, right? Because the issue at hand, let's say that you're debating, you know, the Baptist denomination or, you know, just God in general. The issue is what? Right, whether or not God exists and the reasons for that, holding that belief, right? The issue is not why you believe what? Right, the issue is not why you believe it, and the issue is not why you disbelieve it. The issue is what are your arguments for it, right? What are your arguments against it, right? Something like that. I'll, I'll get up, take the pen off, and not write anything on um, So, what's our less controversial example of the genetic fallacy? Because remember, what, what I point out, or tried to point out Thursday, that the ad hominem, at home and circumstantial, and this fallacy are probably what you're going to see the most of on a daily basis, if not, or at least weekly, if not daily basis. What's another example of the genetic fallacy? You guys. <laughs> What if you said, what if someone said, let's use another controversial example, but I mean, not like as controversial, but what if someone says, well, you believe that because you watch CNN all day long. Well, that may be why you believe it, right? But if the implication is it's false, that's the example of what? Genetic fallacy, because it's, you may hate CNN, right? But they still could tell the truth about whatever that particular thing is, right? You'd have to see that for other reasons. Again, the flip side, well, yeah, the reason you believe that is because you watch Fox News all day long. Right. So what could happen? Still be true, right? Just because Fox News said it, what? Right, doesn't mean it's false. It could still be true, right? You have to, what? Judge the issue for what? Right. You have to judge the issue on its own merit, right? You have to look at the reasons for or against it. If, if you hold all your beliefs because some talking head on Fox News says something, they could still be true, right? If you hold your beliefs because some talking head on CNN says something, they could still be what? They could still be true. Right? See, see, these are examples you'll see every day. I hear college professors say that all the time. Hey, man, you need to turn it off whatever news channel and watch this, and then maybe you wouldn't be such an idiot, or maybe you wouldn't believe all that stuff. Like, genetic fallacy. It's irrelevant, right? Again, because what are these fallacies? What Literally, what did we just say? They're what? What did I just use? Right. Distractions, they're irrelevant. It's irrelevant, but that stuff passes as persuasive in our culture, right? Even among the intelligentsia, right? What they are saying, Right, so you have to at least look at <laughs> is there a reason for the court to be right in that sense, right? Now, that's actually another form, that's actually another informal fallacy called cliche. Why is that, why is that, uh, why is that a fallacy? We'll just go ahead and skip to that one. Why is it a fallacy to use, to say, to use a cliche to prove an argument? What's that? Well, no, not necessarily because they're always used. There's always, almost always what in regards to cliches, a counter cliche, right? So what if someone says, hey, man, you ought to do this. Why should I do it? Nothing venture, nothing gain. Or what if he asks the next guy, hey, man, why should I do this? He says, hey, I would do it better safe than sorry. You see what I'm saying? Those are two exactly, exactly opposite cliches that say the exact same thing to the same guy in, in, in the same situation, but they apply the same thing. One says do it, one says don't do it. Right? So you can't use a cliche, what? To prove an argument. Right? You have to use what to prove an argument? Reasons. Right? You have to give reasons. Right? So, we, so we'll skip cliche when we get there. Alright, so two quote K. This is also another one you'll hear all the time. Tukul K is just roughly Latin for YouTube, right? Not the band YouTube, but like as in like also, right? So you also, now what do you think an example of this 
of this fallacy would be you hear this all it's so easy to use these on like religion and politics because these are just the topics you hear them almost all the time used on and in regard to so what's an example of you also fallacy What's an example? It's essentially the hypocrite fallacy, right? What do I mean by that? You too, you also. What do I mean by that? This is my wife's favorite fallacy. <laughs> what do I mean? What's, what is it, what's the, we'll just call it, so you understand it better, the hypocrite fallacy. What is an example of that? Are saying that they don't do what they don't do it right so let's say like i'm like all right look guys for the state of your family for the state of your kids it's really best to be you know stay with their biological mom or dad something like that like, hey haven't you been married six times <laughs> well yeah well then i don't want to spend this to you then now why is that fallacious doesn't mean i'm wrong it just means that i'm what a hypocrite. It means I can't live up to my own standard, right? But it doesn't mean what? What? What doesn't follow? Right. That's exactly right. It may it may hurt my credibility, but what? It doesn't mean you're wrong, right? So, in fact, I, I was watching a uh, watching CNN one day. I was watching these two guys go at it, and the guy says, "What is this guy arguing?" He's arguing something like that, like men should, you know, treat their wives with respect or whatever, this kind of thing, stay with them, you know, even when it gets tough, something like that. Well, then the host says, what well, essentially what I just said, he said, um, he said, don't you think, you know, it is ridiculous for you to sit here and say that when, you know, and then he brought his past or something. And the guy said, I don't tell you what the guy said yet because it was a brilliant example. He completely turned the tables. But before, so before we say that, he basically tried to discredit his conclusion how by showing what? To okay, right? You too, you've done this. Well, it doesn't mean he's false, right? It doesn't mean what he's saying is false. It just means that he's whatever. Well, instead of the guy, you know, obviously he probably has a philosophy course, but he could think straight. So the first thing he said in response was just ingenious. The guy says, you know, you shouldn't be saying that because you blah, 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 blah. Well, then the guy said to the host, the, the, the news the, the news anchor guy, he said, well, wait a minute. He said, Did, weren't you in a, don't you tell everyone all the time, haven't you started these organizations to kick kids off the streets and not be in gangs and whatever? And the guy was like, yeah. And he said, weren't you in a gang? And the guy was like, well, you know. <laughs> He's like, right. So just because you were in a gang doesn't mean that the fact that what you're saying now about kids not being gang in gangs is what? False. It just means that you screwed up too, right? Now, like Piper said, it may hurt your credibility, right? But it doesn't mean that what? That what you're saying is wrong or false, right? By the way, I haven't been married six times. We don't say something just had Hang on, guys. I'm having a hard time hearing to tell you about here. Sorry, go ahead again. Possibly, if, if so, you're saying that if you've experienced something, then that gives you more credibility in a sense to say, like, look, I've experienced this, so don't do it because I went through it and it screwed my life up, something like that, right? And that may be true, but the two court K fallacy really has more to do with. Um, cause that's even, that's debatable, right? Even that's debatable. Maybe, maybe it gives you a leg up, you know, in offering advice. Maybe it doesn't. Um, but really this fallacy is really more like you're still doing it right now. Oh. Right. So, so really the more applicable situation would be, let's say right now I'm lecturing you on being faithful to your spouse or whatever, and I'm being unfaithful to my spouse right now. And they're like, dude, I saw you last night, you know, with, you know, Shalandra over here, 
and you're telling me right now to be with my old bride. So now, does that completely discredit, does that mess up my credibility in what I'm saying? Yeah, sure it does, absolutely. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that I'm what? Right, I still could be right, because again, what did that fallacy do? It diverted the issue, it diverted what, the attention away from the issue and put it upon me or whatever I'm doing wrong or whatever I'm screwed up with. It doesn't have anything to do with what? The issue, the issue has to be judged on what? It's on merits. Remember, that's when we go through all these fallacies, all of these are pushing, uh, the, the, are pushing the attention away from the issue at hand, right? Now, you see why they're so powerful. Remember, before we started talking about these, we were like, yeah, I'll probably, probably in your mind, like, nah, I probably don't do any of this stuff. But we do every one of these things, right? We dismissed or dismissed conclusions that people are trying to offer based on what fallacious styles of reasoning we've committed genetic fallacy or we see the genetic fallacy committed we've seen ad hominems probably on a daily basis we see this on a daily basis right because you can you now do you have to say do you have to say like well no they're not a hypocrite no you can say no they're a hypocrite but what they're saying may still what it still may be right all right something like that now, this is one of my favorite, argumentum ad ignorantium. It means just from ignorance. So, what's, what do you think an example of this is, an argument from ignorance? Go ahead, Piper. Uh, um, it's, uh, it's like people who say they see UFOs, where they don't know what it is, but then they go, therefore it's aliens from outer, outer space, because what's the other possible? Well, let's make it a little more clear. Let's, but if you're not, you're not wrong there. But let's make it a little more clear. It's like saying this. It's like saying, like, hey, uh, you know, Corinna, have you ever proved there's no UFOs? And so then there are probably UFOs in it. Um, okay. Right. That's an argument from ignorance. Like you can't, <laughs> you can't draw a conclusion from nothing. That's why I like how this guy says it here. Ignorance proves nothing, and that can be, and all that can be concluded from nothing is what? Nothing, right? You can't use it in, in ignorance. You can't, you can't appeal to what you don't know and then to prove something, because what is not knowing? What does that prove? If you're using this, which I just grabbed what? Nothing. I can't use it to prove what? It's something I don't have, I'm not, I don't have anything, right? But people do it all the time, right? Right? Now, you can see this again. Let's go back to controversial subjects. Can you prove that God doesn't exist? Can you prove there's no God? Well, then I'll say there must be a God. That's an argument from ignorance. It's a terrible argument. Now, you can do the opposite. Can you prove right now to me that there's a God? Right now, can you show me that? Well, no. Well, then there's not a God. Argument. Both of those are what? I've seen both sides use that argument. Terrible argument. Why? Because again, all that can be concluded from nothing is what? Nothing. Now, again, you see how those are persuasive though? And like it gets see the rules of Aristotle, like, yeah, that's a misstep. No, yeah, that's a misstep. And then Lang still. Like, right, this is this stuff's used so often and was and was used so often that Aristotle would say, no. Oh, no, no, no. And then names them so that now you got a little tool bag, you know, and somebody does this stuff, you're like, oh, this is argument from ignorance. Here. Here you go. You see this. But you see what that's so, so What's another example from an argument from ignorance? Guys, I know y'all know this stuff. Don't make me take my shoes off. That's a non sequitur, right? That's <laughs> irrelevant. All right. Argument from silence. What's an argument from silence? Argument from silence. What is one? What? What? All right, what's the most thing? Are you up for silence? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's pretty, 
it, it, I think it's kind of self-explanatory. It's one of those where you think I'm so stupid and all just looks at you and No, it's not that. <laughs> 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 no, that's a good. That's a good guess. That's a good, go ahead. Is that where the person that you were saying, what you're saying, you're saying that? No, that's what when you said nothing. No, that's what she was saying right there. Um, that's a good guess. But the argument from silence is when you try to say something like. Uh, Trying to give it any, a good example. I've got a couple, but I don't think they're really that good. Um, let's see. Uh, it's it's kind of like argument, argument from ignorance. So imagine this. Let's say that I talk about my three girls, right? I've got three little girls. Well, then you say, you go outside and you're all talking about, well, you know, Mr. Crawford is somebody's kids or whatever, you know, and he doesn't have a son. And you're like, why do you know that? Well, because he was talking about his three girls in there. And you say, well, because he didn't even mention the son, so he can't have, he doesn't have one. Right? And he said, it's an argument from silence. Because just because I didn't say anything about having a son, it doesn't mean what? Right? It doesn't mean I don't have one. Right? What's another example? Right, so, uh, right, or they go around telling everybody like so and so, you know, he doesn't like dogs or he doesn't have a dog. Like, well, how do you know? Because you see, you sign on the issue, but you, again, just kind of like are you being principal? There's nothing there. So right. Inference yeah, that's a good way to look at it. So, like a bad, it's like a bad inference. Um, now, there's an exception to this. There's called a strong silence. What do you think I might mean by that? Well, no, what <laughs> strong silence. What, what do you think I mean by that? What might be, how that might be, how might that be an exception? Now, all right. Look, what if you said, Mister Carter, will you please? Let's say we're talking about my kids again. All right, will you please? Um, you know, tell us about your familial background or something like that, or your family. And so I'm like, all right, I have some children. My children are Lily Ray, Lyle Spring, and all right, those are my kids, all right? And then so I start talking about my wife. Now, I didn't mention anything about a son, right? Now, say you go and say, um, say you write this down, say you had to write this down for whatever in your class notes. And then you go and talk about, you know, Russ's kids, you know, and you're like, well, he doesn't have a son. Now, strictly speaking, is that argument from silence? Strictly speaking, yes, but that's a strong silence. Why? Well, no, because you ask me to label out my kids, I, I write them down, right? I write them down, which is probably pretty indicative of what that I probably don't have what a son right now logically could there possibly still still be that 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 possibility sure but that's an argument from some strong song so if I so if I'm up here talking about my kids I write my kids down names down they literally put numbers beside their name like you can probably infer that I don't have a son based on that right now, actually, an example is pretty funny. Again, we, we'll use this because we're in the Bible Belt. Every once in a while, you'll get like, you know, breaking news that comes out about something about, you know, Jesus of Nazareth or whatever. Well, there's an example of one where they talk about Jesus being married. Well, if you're familiar with any of the New Testament passages, any New Testament text, there's a passage in, uh, I believe it's Corinthians, where uh, Paul. The Apostle Paul lists out reasons why they should be able to be married, something like that. Because somebody is, you know, giving them a hard time they can be married or not married. Well, he lists out these reasons as to why uh, 
essentially this. Long story short, he this is what scholars have used in these debates back and forth. So you'll see where Paul lists out that the apostles have wives, right? So he says, why should the, the apostles and the disciples, the guys that follow Jesus, why should they be able, allowed to have wives, you know, and then you're going to get mad at me for not having saying I can't have a wife, whatever the case may be. Well, he's trying to justify that it's okay to have a wife, right? For a follower of Jesus to have a wife. That's what he's trying to, 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 just, to justify here, or the disciples of Jesus to have wives. He's trying to justify that. So, he, 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 again, he talks about all, his, all, all the disciples of Jesus that had these wives, but then he doesn't list who. Right. Now, is that an argument from silence? Could Jesus have had a wife? Logically speaking, yes, right? Because he doesn't list him. But that would be an example of a strong silence. Why? Well, if he's trying to prove that he's okay in having a wife and he's listing out or these disciple guys that followed this Jesus guy around is having wives, well, wouldn't it have been conducive to him just to say, oh, and by the way, Jesus had a wife. That would have been conducive for him to say that, right? Now, strictly speaking, is that an argument from silence? Could it logically be possible? Logically speaking, Jesus had a wife. Yeah, it's an argument from silence. But they would say it's a what? Strong silence, right? Something like that. Anyway, that's just probably one of the best examples or the easiest you can give being where, where we live now in our culture. Fallacies of relevance. Argumentum ad misericordium. Now, again, you hear this all the time. What do you think misericordium means? Remember, most of this is Latin. <laughs> yes, it means Latin. Argumentum ad Latin. <laughs> misericordium means, where do you think, where do you think the word misery comes from? No, right, misery, right? Misericordium. So it's an appeal to pity. What might an example of that be? What might be an appeal to pity? Right, therefore what? <laughs> so if I were to say, if one of my students were to say, Mr. Corr, last night, you know, I was, was watching Leno and my mom came in there and she punched me in the face and, you know, Blah blah. Anyway, that's why I didn't get this work done. And if I don't, if I, if you give me a zero, then I'll fail this course. Does that have anything to do with what? Right. That have anything to do with that, right? That's an appeal to pity. It doesn't follow that because those things happen that your grade should be a different thing, right? Or think of it this way, Judge. If we convict this man, like, who's going to raise his children? If you sit here and convict this man of this particular crime, then his wife and his kids and blah, 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 does that have anything to do with whether he did what he did or did not do what he did? Now, should that be taken into consideration? Possibly, right? But that has no bearing as to what? His actual innocence or his actual what? Guilt. It just, it's irrelevant to whether he's innocent or guilty. Should it be taken into consideration? Possibly. But, go ahead. So in the Brock Turner case, like an example of like the... Again. Remind me of that. Oh, yeah, the swimmer guy. He's the kid. Right, he's the kid. 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 He's the kid.
Um, but if someone if someone were trying to, to try to argue that, well, you know, his career or his life will be ruined or whatever, um, should that be taken into consideration? Possibly, but is that anything to do with his guilt or innocence? No, it doesn't have anything to do with it, right? That's an appeal to pity, right? Does that have anything to do with the guilt of the, or innocence of the crime? By the way, let's let's just on a side note here. Does time, does, does the duration of a crime have anything to do with, with, the, with the guilt of a crime? So if, like Piper said, oh, uh, you know, it, it only, this 20 minutes shouldn't reflect his entire life or whatever. If he, if he did 20 minutes of this crime or whatever, that shouldn't be, he shouldn't pay for that for 20 years or whatever the case may be. Does time have anything to do with, uh, does the duration of time have anything to do with crime? Well, not. What's that? It's, it's like you're, you're basically troubled for whatever. Or should it have anything to do with punishment, the extent, the extension of a punishment? Should time, should the duration that it took you to commit a crime, should it have anything to do with the duration of your punishment? What's that? Okay. It shouldn't, right? Why? How long does it take to murder someone? Right. But in, 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 but in principle, it can easily be done with what? In, in, in less than a second, right? So should your crime, so should your punishment be less than a second? Well, that doesn't seem to follow, right? Now remember that when we get in a couple of weeks, we get something that's going to be huge because if you think that that's a viable principle that punishment shouldn't necessarily have anything to do with time, that's probably going to bite you butt about three or four weeks when we get down to a different argument because you'll probably you won't realize it, but you'll want to jump to that even though you've already conceded that, that probably should be used. All right, so anyway, a pill to penny, let's go ahead and skip that one. Now this is awesome one too, argumentum ad copulum. What's this one? Now this is going to be distinguished from argument of a uh, uh, consensus gentium, which is argument of the majority. This is going to be argument I'm at popular, which means it has to do with more with like a popular type trend. What's an example of this? Or if, they, if someone appeals to that for the reason that you should take it, right? Look, man, everybody at our college is holding this particular position, right? It could be that, but let's, it, but in real life, it could be something more, let's make it more, let's make it more realistic and controversial. Let's make it, let's make it realistic. Everybody in this college that has anything to do with what current events is supporting this particular stance on blah, blah, blah. So, I give the rats a, right? It doesn't matter. The issue is what? The issue is the issue. What are your reasons for the issue for holding that stance, right? Or what are your reasons against holding that stance? Like it doesn't matter if everybody in this classroom holds to that particular position, you know, if it's popular within your society, it's irrelevant. Again, that's irrelevant as to the truth of that particular position. And see, this is the one that everybody thinks they're free of from and Almost everybody's a slave to this right here. All right? Think about whatever your particular position is right now that you're like your favorite little position that you're holding, and think about how popular that may be right now in our society. Now go back to 1830 and say, All right, your position, look, nobody holds that right now. So that can't possibly be a reason as to give why you should hold that position, right? Because in one period of time, it may not be popular, and in one period of time, it may be very popular, right? Think of an example of that. What's an example of that? What's an example of that? Go ahead. Well, they can say nobody believes that. So is that by itself, that can't be, that has to be an invalid reason for using to prove your argument, right? Or think about slavery, right? 
Why do you not? Why do you not hold slaves? Nobody does that. What kind of idiot would do? Nobody does that. That's just an appeal. That's just an argument I'd popular. That's not a good reason to not hold slaves, right? Why? Because you could use that in 1830 to support what? Slavery. You go back to 1830 and say, why should I not hold slaves? Everybody holds slaves. Like, what, what kind of idiot would believe not to do that? Like, we all do this. Like, what do you do? Like, you see what I'm saying? You can't appeal to the popular trend to support your position. Because obviously, just one example of least that we've seen, you could show this to be wrong in all kinds of ways, but just one example is just, all right, go to a different time period and try to do that with that particular position, right? All right, let's again, let's make it controversial. Let's say that you, like, let's say that you're, how's a good one? What's one that's really, what's a cultural hot button? Oh, here's two good ones. Let's use same-sex marriage. Let's say someone says, why do you not support same-sex marriage? Everybody at this entire university that has half of a college degree realizes that you should support same-sex marriage. That's an argument I'm popular. It's irrelevant. Terrible argument, right? Why, again, go back to 1830. You should support the traditional stance on marriage. Look around. Everybody supports the everybody. Everybody that's graduated from every Ivy League institution supports the traditional stance of marriage in 1830. Who are you to sit here and say that you shouldn't support that? See how they they can appeal to, to the popular majority, right? Just like you can appeal to the popular majority now, right? So if you support or don't support that stance, that better not be your reason. I say crappy, crappy reason. Why? Zero. It's irrelevant what, what the popular trend in your society is. You have to have a different argument, right? In fact, you have to have what? An actual argument, right? Appealing to the popular trend is, as we say in the South, piss poor, right? It's one word. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. You have to have arguments, right? You have to have reasons. See again, do you see the brilliance of Aristotle? Remember, he just sat there and noticed all these things. Nothing new under the sun, right? I mean, think about it. 2,500 years ago, this guy's pointing out stuff that people are still doing, are still what? Using. Because they work. Crappy lines of reasoning, what? Unfortunately, what? Work. Consensus gentium. Now, this is a, this is very similar to argument on ad populum or argument, you know, to the mass, this kind of thing. This is very similar to that. This is the appeal to the uh, majority. Now, how is, the, how is this similar, first and foremost? How is this similar to the one we just talked about? We're, you're appealing to some big group outside of yourself, right? Now, the other has more to do with what? As you two are just saying. A majority of people. Right. The other may not necessarily be a majority, right? It just may be widely popular. It may be a very popular trend, but it still may not be the majority opinion, right? Now, consensus gentium just is what? The actual majority. Well, now, what are some examples of that? We could even go back to our other example, right? We could just say, let's imagine the majority of the population believes one way or the other. You still can't use that for what? <laughs> right. You still can't use that for your argument, right? Because why? You can just go back in time and try to use the same argument see if it supports the exact opposite conclusion, right? And if your argument supports contradictory positions, if your argument supports the exact opposite con conclusion at a different time and place, then that's a really bad argument, right? In fact, it's not even an argument, it's a fallacy, right? What might be another example of this besides the ones we already talked about? Like you're an atheist and you stumble into a church or something. All of a sudden, people like in the church, like you, you believe God or God, but why should I believe in the Yeah, I mean, yeah, so, yeah, so. 
Right. So if a, or you don't have to be in the church. You could just say, strictly speaking, the world, right? So 90-something percent of the population believes in God, right? You don't even have to be in the church. 90-something percent of the world's population believes in God. So if you were to say, you need to believe in God, why do you actually believe in God? Because 90-something percent of the world's population believes in God. Right? That's in consensus gentium, right? Now, why is that a terrible argument? Right. Well, let's go to the year 2160. Let's say that that particular time, that let's say atheism is, is dominant as far as the belief system goes. And what if someone says, why should I be an atheist? And they say, because 99% of this world population doesn't believe in God. You just prove the exact opposite of your conclusion what earlier, right? With the exact same one argue, well, argument there in parentheses is fallacy. It won't work, right? You have to have what? You have to have reasons as to why you shouldn't believe in God, right? Or you should have reasons as to why what you should believe in God, right? But do we use these things all the time? Do you see society use this kind of stuff all the time, right? In fact, well, we'll get to that. So. Appeal to authority. Sweet Moses, this is probably the worst one, or the one that makes me the most mad. Because this becomes, this comes across as the most, uh, quote unquote, intellectual type of, uh, of, of objection, even though it's just as fallacious as any other type of objection. Oh. What's an example of this? Go ahead. I think you're referencing an article on Galileo, and it's like a scholarly article, and it's so like, okay, it's still going to be, it's still going to be wrong, even if you have like all of these like, okay people writing it and putting it together. So well, it looks good. Well, possibly. That's why, I, personally, I said I draw a distinction between the above and a false inappropriate authority. So if you have an appeal to authority, I would say, really, what you're really looking for is, is an appeal to an inappropriate authority. Okay. So so why would I say, so what, what, is the, what do I mean by that? I'm a dietitian, not an MD. Right, or even worse. Like, what if I'm sitting here talking about, you know, well, Let's use it. Let's, let's go to hot button cultural issue examples. Because they're just easy, right? Everybody, remember, everybody has an opinion on, on them and they just instantly rile you up, right? So let's use those. Who remembers Bill Nye the Science Guy? Right, I do. Right? He seems like an intelligent individual, right? I mean, he is, right? But then he gets on the internet and starts making arguments, or not arguments, but Basically, what right, argument, not arguments, but you start saying stuff against what position? His, his, his degree is, in, he's an engineer, right? He's got to be a bachelor's in engineering. So, he may have a master's in engineering too. So. He does have Right, but he gets on, the thing on, he gets on popular, like, channels and, and what argues what you know, the, one of me argues particularly against saying the, the abortion issue right and then so people quote bill nye as if he as if he's an authority on what that's an inappropriate appeal to authority no matter what bill nye thinks right now again like whatever your particular stance is on the abortion issue you probably should use as your sources and your citations for your argument who by biologists or philosophers who deal with that particular issue, right? Now, would it be the genetic fallacy to say Bill Nye's wrong? Yeah, well, right, because that's your, he may be right, but you can't quote him as your what? Right, because he's not that's not his, that's not his field, right? So these are usually issues, easy issues to talk about because they're just so easily recognizable. So when someone, say, quotes Einstein, in relation to certain beliefs on God or not. Einstein's not a philosopher or a theologian. What is he? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or a theoretical physicist or something like that, right? He deals with cosmology. Is his, is his field the study of philosophy, religion, and theology? No. 
And so if you're trying to prove some argument in regard to God's existence, because I've seen both sides use Einstein. If you're trying to use Einstein for your side, you're doing this right here. And it's an appeal to an inappropriate authority. Now, again, are you, is he wrong because he's not a philosopher of religion or a theologian? Maybe, maybe not, but that's not who you quote and what to prove your case. Because they, basically, you're, you're just trying to ride the coattails of his credentials, right? Well, Einstein says, so? Right? What are his arguments? Right. Yeah, that would be the worst example of it. I mean, but, yeah, I mean, it is. No, I don't mean your worst example. I'm saying, like, that would be, like, the bottom of the barrel of somebody trying to say, well, Wikipedia says, right? So if someone, right, so if someone's, <laughs> I'm just trying to understand. So if someone were to say, to make what you're saying, all right, if someone would say, well, Wikipedia says, blah, 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 right? Not anymore. Wikipedia is still really bad. I get so frustrated reading yeah. Wikipedia. Yeah. So. You've never seen an edit for the agent that goes through. Dude, I have an account where I can get on Wikipedia and edit stuff. And then, like, I can edit stuff on Wikipedia and put in what I know is 100% like right information on that particular issue. I'll go back a week later, someone has re edited my edits. And you're just like, ah, oh, this, this is what's good. I, I remember right, you can go back to previous edits. <laughs> one time. Hopefully one time. One time. I was in eighth, um, eighth grade three consecutive school years. Um, before they had uh, page blocks, um, I edited the entire edition of this page to say that it was founded by Del Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> and it was all there for like three weeks before somebody noticed that Spain was edited. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. It's a pretty good prank. I'm a, fan, I'm a fan of good pranks. Now there's probably somebody running around quoting what Wikipedia says that Spain was founded by Fidel Castro, which shows exactly why that's you probably shouldn't quote Wikipedia. Um, so anyway, have any of you guys seen this right here? Uh, what's another example of this? What's another example of this? Let's say my little girl I up her with her math homework last night. And let's say she goes back to school and the teacher says, number five is wrong. And she says, my dad teaches college courses. He is very, very smart. Number five is not wrong. Well, it's a math problem, right? Like, because I teach philosophy to college folks, that doesn't mean that I'm also what? A math genius, right? Now, does that mean I'm wrong? No, I still would be right, but... She can't appeal to her dad, the philosophy teacher, who she thinks is very intelligent, in order to do what? Math problems, right? I'm out of my field. That's not my discipline, right? Now, hopefully, I'm not, hopefully, I'm not going to miss a, you know, a first grade math problem. <laughs> but you see how that would be an inappropriate appeal to authority, right? Now, this is a good one. Argumentum ab anis. I won't say that way. Chronological snobbery. What's a good argument on it? What's a, what's a good example of this one? You're on the right track, but that's not necessarily it. That would be more of an argument ad hominem, right? Because you're talking about their specific age. What's the argument on that on us because of age chronological? What does chronological mean? Well, what, what type of order? Like time, right? Because you can have an order. What Because you can, because you can, because you can have a logical order that has, that's not necessarily chronological, right? Chronological order has to do with what? Time, right? Not necessarily just order, order and time. So let's go back to our, our earlier example because these are just the easy ones. If you can't possibly hold to that stance of marriage, let's say the traditional stance. That's so Victorian. That's so post 18th century. Chronological slobbery. Right. It's so right. If you're, you're basically trying to say that you're, it's the 21st century, man. Right. Get with the times. It's 21st. Who holds that view? That's what chronological snobbery. Like the times have nothing to do with what the issue, right? 
It's completely what? Irrelevant, right? Because again, you could just do the reverse, right? You could do the reverse. Get with the times, man. Everybody has slaves. It's the 18th century. Everybody owns people, right? <laughs> right? So you can't use that to appeal to your... But notice how everyone does this in what? Right? In their own time. But everybody sees it as stupid to have done it then. But what do they do now? It's the 21st century, man. you got to let people love who they want to love. That's irrelevant. Now, you may believe that, which is fine, right? But you have to what? Have an argument for that position, right? It's the 21st century, man, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter if it's the freaking 13th century. The issue is what? The issue is the issue, right? Whatever your stance is on, say, any of those cultural hot-button topics, you have to have what? Arguments and reasons, right? But we see how it's easy. Is it over that time? We say it's easy to what? Just to appeal to what? Fallacious types of reasons, age being one of them. It's just irrelevant. You're an idiot. I'm just kidding. You're not an idiot, but what you just, you're just making what? Idiotic. Right. Idiot type. Right, right, there you go. Spare what I was going to say idiotic type of arguments. You just symbolize it. Simple, symbolize it. I'm the word. Argumentum ad futurist to the future. Now, again, I've seen both sides of the. It's so fun just to talk about the God thing because these are, again, they're just always so easy right off the bat to see the, how people use these on both sides. What is the argumentum ad futurist to the future? Appeal to the future. What are arguments? What's an example of this? What's that? No, not necessarily. Because that's about that should be a valid concern, right? <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. Stockmark. You're on the right track. You're on the right track. So right, here's how both sides use this argument right here. Here's how argument, here's how both sides of the God debate question use this argument. Which one you in first? Which one do you want to hear first? The bad God side or the bad atheistic side? Which one do you hear first? This is like, like say someone believes in God, they're like, oh yeah, well you don't believe in God, you die and you make that hell. Almost, you got the God side, pretty much right, but not the atheist side. So the God side would be something like, you don't believe in God? No, I don't believe in God. Well, then you just wait until Jesus shows up. <laughs> wait till wait, wait the rapture, see what that. Right, now, which may or may not be true, but that can't possibly be what? <laughs> You can't use it for your argument because all you can use for your argument is what? What we have right now, the evidence that we have right now, you can't appeal to the future, right? Now, what's the bad side of that, the atheistic side of that? <laughs> the devil shows it. No, because there would be a meaning that what? The devil really probably can't be an atheist, right? What's that? Right, yeah, but what I thought you see might say you know what the atheist side of that same argument might be? What's the atheistic side of that same argument? At least one one version of that. Well, I don't care that your aunt so and so was completely one hundred percent, you know, paralyzed and then somebody prayed and she was healed instantly. Just wait, one day science will show why that happened. Argument to the future. You have to go with what? What's that? Oh, yeah. People say all the time. Like, I mean, you'll hear a more sophisticated version of that. It'll say something like, you know, science has always shown us where theology thought they had this. Science has always come along and shown us it was really not theology. It was really not God. It was just science. So just wait, and science will figure that out, too. Oh, well, that's not the opposite, because one is an appeal to the future. One is just a what? One just tries to pull a carpet out from under the method, methodology of science itself, right? So 
The reverse of that would be, well, you just wait till Jesus shows up, right? And then the opposite side of that is you basically just wait till science shows up, right? Does that make sense? You have to go with what you have right now for the evidence. You can't appeal to the future. One is called God of the gaps. One is called science of the gaps, right? You have to stay right here and look at what the evidence is right now. You can't constantly appeal to the future, hoping that the future will prove your position. Because when all the data comes in in the future, it may what? It may prove your position what? Position what? Wrong. Right? So you can't appeal to the future to support your position. In a way, that's kind of like ignorance, right? So kind of like appeal to ignorance. You can't appeal to what we don't necessarily know yet. You have to appeal to what we do know. Well, right. In one sense, in one way, it kind of just begs the question that you're already right, right? Well, that's what you're that's what you're trying to prove right now that you are right. When you say when you're appealing to the future, you're just assuming that you are. But that's what we're trying to prove right now, right? Which perfectly goes into this begging question, which is just a circular argument. What is a circular argument? Like we said, in a way, that sort of is in a way, right? Because you're just assuming. In a way that you're already right and you're appealing to the future, saying the future will support you. Well, you don't know that. That's what we're trying to prove right now. Now, that's, that's, but, but the TDO principle really is a circular argument begging the question a little bit different. What's the, what's the terrible God side of the version of this? Uh, I, All right. That's, uh, that's the God's real because it's in the Bible, the Bible is right because God wrote it. Yeah. Right, or let's make let's do it a little more understandable. The Bible is the word of God. How do you know the Bible is the word of God? Because it says it is. That's a circular argument, right? Now, does that mean that the Bible is not the word of God? Maybe or maybe not, but that is the worst argument ever, right? Because why? What could what could someone else do? Now the Quran is the word of God. Why do you know that? Because the Quran says it is. Right? Well now how do you judge between the two? You can't, right? It's just it's just assuming what it's trying to prove, right? It just assumes what it's trying to prove. Now, what's the what is another example of that? A begging question, circular argument. Let me give you another example. Besides that, think of one. Begging the question. Circular argument. What was the one we were saying earlier? That we were singing, we could put those two choruses together. <laughs> yeah, I want to bring my drum. One day I want to bring my drums and my guitar to class. Are you actually going to want to carry all that? Yeah, I do too. Argument. What's another example of circular argument? It's in my baby, it's in my nursery, baby nursery. My wife mad about it. What's another example of circular argument? Oh, I know one that that we can talk about to be fair to both sides if, if the bad circular argument on, on the theistic side the god side is the whole i know the bible is the word of god because the bible says it's the word of god that's here that's a terrible argument don't use it the reverse of that on the other side would be something like going off for a center about somebody being paralyzed or whatever would be say like a miracle is a violation of the laws of nature and we therefore know that the laws of nature can't be violated so therefore miracles can't happen that's a circular argument right because you're assuming what you're assuming your conclusion right you've already assumed it well yeah just by definition if miracles are a violation of the laws of nature and they can't be violated well then by definition what can't possibly ever happen that's the argument, right? That's what you're trying to figure out. Can it happen or can it not happen? Well, if you just define it right out of existence, right out of the gate, then what can't ever happen? The miracle, right? 
just like if you define God's word or God's word, if you define the Bible as God's word, if you define that as God's word, then what is it? By definition, God's word. All right, so those are both bad examples. All right, let's see if we can squeeze one more. How many do we have for? We'll have to do all of these before we leave. Um, I might have to just send you a, uh, a copy of these because these are just all so good. <laughs> Straw man, all these are just like you just really need these, all right? Um, anything for me, leave real quick. Anybody not see their grade? Let's see your table. You got here, you might want to see yours, right? Um, all right, guys, so that is essentially this particular lecture. Now, just as I mentioned at the end of this lecture, um, regarding the uh, the deck, right, or the, 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 um, the, the PDF. If you want more of these particular fallacies, I'll be happy to send those to you if you just reach out to me via email. Um, you can email me at the school email. You can email me at uh, philosophyports at gmail.com. I'll send you the rest of these um, if at all possible. Um, because again, like you heard me say at the end of that lecture, there's just, there's just so many of these left that are, that are just so beneficial to speak of, talk about, for instance, straw man. Um, this is, you know, quick example is just when you when you when you create a very weak version of your opponent's argument right uh it's called a straw man because they're easy to attack right they're easy to beat down as opposed to a real man or a steel man as uh some people say that now right they like to use the term steel man so when you steel man your opponent's argument that means you're constructing the the, the, the most uh uh potent or strongest version of that argument available that's what you want to try to do if you're disagreeing um, with someone else. You want to be able to construct their argument in a strong way, right? Um, and again, so just anyway, looking through these special pleading, cherry picking data, um, poisoning the well, kind of like gossip kind of stuff about your opponent before they even get to get their story out. Um, fallacy of diversion, non sequitur. That's kind of a catch all term that we use for any kind of argument that just doesn't follow from the premises that are laid out, right? Um, red herring, probably heard of some of these. Um, there's again, Look, we've got so many just flipping through here, but this lecture is already long enough. And I know you probably are, have got a lot to digest here. Um, also, if you've taken the logic course with me, you're going to see a lot of these in the that particular book, whether it be the Socratic Logic by Kraft or whether it be the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Come Let Us Reason uh, text by Geisler and I think Brooks, maybe Geisler and Brooks. Um, but so you'll have all of these there um, as well in those two texts that you can check out as well. Again, if you want to, just send me an email. I'll be happy to, to do these if, if at all possible. Um, fallacy of composition. So, yeah, we've, we've just got a lot more that we could even go into if we wanted to. Um, however, having said that, um, we'll continue in our journey in this intro to philosophy um, next class, probably starting with our issues of epistemology. So I'll see you there.